This video is brought to you by Squarespace. What's up, Meta Nerds? This video is going to be a complete breakdown of the history of Kalto and Bacta, how they work, and the politics and wars that surrounded these substances. And we'll end on some cool behind the scenes facts. The story of the magical healing blue liquid starts thousands of years before the Battle of Yavin, with the recently split Sith and Jedi Order. The rapid technological improvements of weapons of war led to similar advancements in medicine, and the Selkath species of the planet Manan had a breakthrough that would forever change the galaxy. These aquatic people believe that their distant evolutionary ancestor was the progenitor, a line that split into the Selkath and the violent and powerful sharks known as the Fraxa. This progenitor fish was found mostly in an underwater canyon known as the Hrakert Rift, and a whole spiritual reverence was developed around this creature, which may have been the result of the very physical effects of the Kalto. There is a heavy debate over the role of the progenitor. Some believe that it secreted the Kolto, and it isn't clear if that was meant to mean from oil glands, sexual fluids, or even just urine and feces, while others believe that it merely guards the goo that comes up from the sea floor through the rift, like some sort of crude oil. So maybe it's both, and that it's an oil generated from millions of years of these decomposing fish. Though off-world researchers think that the ricotta are behind this miracle juice, as the progenitor was much larger than other species related to it, and it was known to protect the ricotta and star map. So the Kalto could have been a ricotta creation left behind that the fish simply fed on, leading this particular progenitor to grow to an incredible size, as it was drinking straight from this river of youth that flowed under the sea. And to make things even stranger, when the Selkath worked with the Republic to establish a secret undersea outpost in order to collect the blue goo even quicker, the progenitor was driven into a frenzy, somehow affecting the minds of its evolutionary cousins, as the sharks became singularly focused with trying to devour anyone they spotted, and the Selkath working in the facility went mad. The next thing we knew, our Selkath researchers started screaming and, 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 and clawing at everything around them. My team? My team was torn apart and eaten before my eyes. It was Revan who was sent to investigate, and when he destroyed the equipment, everything calmed down, and the progenitor even allowed him to pass and interact with the star map. So it definitely seems to be protecting this Rakanan relic. Now this event was a disaster for the Selkath Council, as the Miracle Juice allowed them to be one of the few neutral worlds in this time of galactic war. <laughs> Their only hub above water was the Port Otto City, where you could see Republic and Sith representatives peacefully coexisting, a neutral island in the Sea of War, all due to the Selkath promising mutual destruction. If anyone invaded them, they would simply destroy the sources of Kaltho, and then each military would be forced to truly experience the cost of these wars. It's a dark and twisted way to think of it, uh, but perhaps wise and applicable, that Kaltho worked to make these wars more palatable to their citizens. Of course people died, but you had a lot less that were maimed and disabled. There wasn't an obvious exterior wound that would be shocking to civilians. If someone fought in a war, they were either dead and could not tell their story, or the veterans that were alive looked fine on the outside, so the war just sounded like a great adventure. No lasting damage to the body, nothing that forced the civilians to have to see some of the horrors of war. So for the reasons of keeping their forces constantly renewed for new battles, but also for morale and political reasons, the Kalto had to keep flowing. That's why the destruction of this facility was such an issue, and Revan strikes a deal with the Council to keep the whole things under wraps, while they relied on reserves and worked on other ways to harvest Kalto. Throughout the Jedi Civil War and for centuries after, you would find Kalto tanks on every large warship, government buildings and hospitals, even some privately owned ones where you would be connected to a breathing apparatus and tech to monitor vitals, and likely something to provide food and water, as the person would often be floating in here for around 12 hours, if not multiple days, which would have had at least a lot of the psychological effects of something like a float tank. And we should consider that perhaps they would be fasting. Maybe there was no hookups for food and water, hoping to activate some of the body's own repair mechanisms in concert with this healing concoction. But by far, most of the Kalto was administered in smaller doses, via portable technologies used in combat. Kalto was in the ubiquitous med packs, delivered through injections on wrist-mounted darts, or hovering medical probes that would follow you and administer the juice automatically while you kept fighting. And the even rarer missile that worked like a chemical gas weapon, but instead of releasing poison, it would release a cloud of healing mist that would bind to any wounds. There were countless attempts to make artificial Kalto, 
but all of them failed. The only thing close was that you could cut pure culto with other medicinal compounds like spice. Some on the black market using narcotics that mostly just covered up the pain, and provided a euphoric effect that made you think you were healing, and might be combined with a small amount of culto, though most contained none of it at all. And though culto was still in use during the High Republic era of 300 BBY to 82 BBY, it was really rare by then, and had lost its status as the go-to healing compound around 300 years after Reverend's actions on Manan, with the invention of Bacta from the Vratic species. It was made by combining bacterias, which is why it's called Bacta, and many types of Bacta were made from these bug species for as long as their people could remember. It's unclear which off-worlders first sought to turn the Bacta into a mass-produced medicine, but at first it was just combined with Kalto, one of the only effective versions of that cutting with the other spice like I mentioned. The native Vratics were a simple and peaceful people, who wished to just work the fields and enjoy village life, and were okay with off-worlders setting up operations on their world Thyphera. By now the supply of Kalto was dwindling, these underwater veins running dry, and although prices soared, it was the death throes of the Manan economy and the Selkath faded into galactic obscurity, with all eyes turned to these curious combinations of bacteria exclusive to Thyphera. What was once used in small amounts as balm for wounds was now combined with the technological wonders of the space-traveling civilizations, which brought a potent new blue juice to the market. But the fragile nature of the bacteria environments helped to keep this world free and relatively unbothered, as the people at large knew to make sure that this fountain of youth stayed pure. Instead of meddling on world, it seems that they took advantage of the fact that this was bacteria. Not a strange fish or a non-renewable resource like the oil seen from the cult of vents. Instead, it was better to take from this fountain and cultivate these bacteria in your own labs as best you could. And it doesn't appear like any major or destructive mining operations ever posed a threat to the Vratix or the planet of Thyphera. And you could imagine that, like with Manon, all factions in any given war knew that if they destroyed the Bacta source, it would hurt them just as much, and probably get everybody else to team up against you. And like its predecessor, it came in every form from patches to grenades, with the most recognizable being these Bacta tanks. We don't know how much a Kalto tank cost, but these would be anywhere from 3,000 to 100,000 credits, and most would be about 2 meters tall and weigh 500 kilos. But there were likely larger ones for larger species. And while the patient appears to be asleep or somehow in a medically induced coma, we don't know that for sure, though we do get an interesting detail about the experience is that most reported an overwhelming taste of lum, an alcohol that formed from the component bacteria Elasi and this taste would remain in your nose and mouth for days after a full back to tank immersion. By the time of the Clone Wars, Darth Sidious was putting into place his scheme of monopolizing Bacta. First, the Trade Federation falsified claims of bacteria shortages, causing the price of Bacta to skyrocket, and of course there was the strain of the Clone Wars. So that when the Empire was declared, Palpatine was able to frame the unregulated production of Bacta as a sign that someone was preparing for war. You couldn't cultivate the bacteria in your own labs. Now the Empire would be the only one allowed to produce the blue juice, and it all had to be done on Thyphera, which made it a lot easier to lock down. And although trying to stop production across the galaxy would be hard to prevent, if anyone was found to be in possession of these bacteria, they knew they would be treated worse than a spice dealer. Not some criminal, but questioned as a potential terrorist of the Rebel Alliance. And I never fully appreciated this, but the Bacta tank that Luke would use was one of the prized possessions of the Alliance, right up there with things like the massive ion cannon, and way harder to get than shield generators. At this time, trying to get your hands on both the tank and the Bacta fluid itself was only made possible by years of growing allies and trade connections. Imagine how important this was for a smaller rebellion, where charismatic individuals really could make a difference. But just to be thorough, Palpatine did invade Manan just to enslave the Selkath species, trying to make sure any remaining sources of Kulto was also in Imperial hands. Now from the Clone Wars through the Galactic Civil War era, two corporations, Zaltin and Zukfra, had come to represent a kind of duopoly, referred to as the Bacta Cartel. They were puppets for the Empire that jacked up the prices at the Emperor's will, a giant scheme to get more tax credits into the war machine. Palpatine was also using these companies to secretly make a complete sequencing of all variants of Bacta and develop compounds that could neutralize them. A horrifying but undeniable order from the Emperor, which all assumed was to be used as an emergency chemical weapon by the Empire in the event of rebellion. 
And because of things like this, and the growing rumors of success by the Rebel Alliance, combined with the native bug's own growing frustration with the humans, the primary stockholder of Zaltan Corporation plotted to aid the Rebels. And three and a half years after the Battle of Endor, the Bacta War erupted. Just months earlier, the Empire released the Crytovirus, a genetically engineered bioweapon that targeted non-humans, resulting in the deaths of millions. It doesn't seem that Palpatine's plot to make Bacta neutralizing chemicals ever panned out, so instead, the de facto leader of the Imperial Remnant, Yasani Azard, took her Super Star Destroyer Lusankia straight to Thyferna after the fall of Coruscant. Knowing that locking down the supply of Bacta would accelerate the death toll and force the New Republic to negotiate. And when the NR didn't want to approve a rogue squadron attack, they all resigned, including their leader Wedge Antilles. He would go on to orchestrate an unsanctioned guerrilla force that would use their fighters to raid back to shipments between Imperial forces, selling some at a great profit to buy more ships, weaponry, and mercenary forces, eventually growing to include a full squadron of Twi'lek pilots using their uglies. Uglies being a term for cobbling together parts of ships, theirs were made from combining TIE fighter cockpits with X-wing engines, weapons, and S-foils. This ragtag group was able to snowball their victories over Star Destroyers, and then with some unexpected NR help, finally take the Star Destroyer Lusankia. The Vradix rebels captured the site's planet side, but Izard would escape. With the Bacta producing bugs, now enthusiastic allies of the New Republic, they were able to save millions of lives, but this scarcity left a scar in the psyche of the NR citizens. Even as late as 1980Y, it was common for doctors to vacuum out any Bacta residue from their patients, making sure they saved each drop and extended it all as long as possible. So that's it for its history and breakdown, but you definitely want to hear these cool facts and behind the scenes stuff. Boba Fett has a Bacta pod, which is a smaller and more portable version, and is pretty restrictive in size. Maybe Cad Bane could fit, and could be potentially healed and incorporated as an ally, but he is taller, and sadly the one who needs it most, Black Chrysanthemum, is almost certainly too big for this model. Hopefully Fett's connections and credits can get him access to a larger one. Some species, like Rodians, would experience complications due to their metabolism, and often had to go in for repeated rounds of submersion. Although Palpatine could not find a Bacta neutralizer, the native Vradix rebels were able to contaminate some batches of Bacta during that Imperial Remnant rule. They would develop in a person to make them allergic to any future Bacta treatments. They hoped this would spread throughout the Imperials, but Yasani Izar discovered it and had it sold off into the black market. Colta was still used on the Imperial prison barge known as the Purge as late as the year 1 ABY and Imperial researchers found that by now it was much weaker than it was during the time of the Jedi Civil War, which was thousands of years earlier. The story of the progenitor fish on Manan is the official account, but if Revan takes the dark side option and releases a poison into the water to kill the progenitor, it also pollutes the sea and source of Kulto. The Selkath will keep it a secret, but ban you from ever returning, and try and outright kill you if you admit to it. The lore leaves these options open, by vaguely mentioning that experts debate the cause of the dwindling supply of Kulto. And the name Manan appears to be a reference to both Irish mythological deity Manan Maclir, who is the god of the sea, and manna from the Bible, the miracle food that fell from the heaven to feed the Hebrews. This ocean planet being the source of the life-sustaining miracle material. So that's it for Kulto and Bacta, the healing liquid of the galaxy far, far away. But on our planet, the lifeline for your website will come from Squarespace. Check out the link down below for 10% off Squarespace. Squarespace allows you to connect with your audience and generate revenue through gated, members-only content. Manage your members, send email communications, and leverage audience insights, all on one easy-to-use platform. Community is key to building your website, and their fully integrated commenting system supports threaded comments, replies, and likes. There are also third-party extensions that are great for e-commerce, like streamline bookkeeping, product promotion, and inventory management, and can automatically push content from your social media channels. The best way to make your website the all-in-one hub you've dreamed of. So use the link in the description to go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, head over to squarespace.com slash metanerds to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thanks again to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. And be sure to check out the links in the description, where you can see links to free audiobooks from Audible, and discounts on amazing metal print art. You can also see our Patreon and PayPal, and I especially want to thank our $25 tier supporters, Bill Payne, Renee Flores, and Oscar Jones. But most important of all, remember, respect the designs of our ancient alien overlords, and take your fish oil to stay healthy, and the Force will be with you, always.